On a warm summer day near your favorite harbor, you are likely to see all types of float aircraft coming and going. Many types can be flown successfully on floats, provided the floats are properly installed and maintained, free of leaks, and the pilot is qualified. Let's follow the activities of some pilots as they go about their business. One charter pilot is flying supplies into a camp on a small lake 50 miles north. He checks the weather and files a flight plan. If the flight were taking him into a sparsely settled area, he would make sure the necessary survival equipment was on board. After this flight, he plans on proceeding several hundred miles north to pick up some fishermen from a lodge. He's checked the refueling situation closely to make sure that the appropriate fuel drums, pumps, and filters are available. His pre-flight is thorough, and he takes care to check the cables and pulleys on the water rudders. Then he pumps the floats, an easy job since there are no leaky compartments in this machine, and stows the float pump on board, along with the paddle, life jackets, and spare ropes. Because this aircraft is also used in salt water, he inspects it particularly closely for corrosion. After the cargo has been weighed and loaded, he secures it properly so it can't shift in flight. The weight and balance is within limits, and the flight is ready to depart. Before leaving the dock, the pilot evaluates the water surface, wind speed, and direction to determine their combined effects on taxiing and the takeoff. The pilot chooses an altitude and route that keeps him within gliding distance of water in case of engine failure. On arrival, he overflies the lake to assess wind direction and strength from the water surface, checks for obstacles such as high trees or wires on the approach, looks for boats, floating debris and swells, studies the length and depth of the landing area, and makes a mental note of the departure and overshoot possibilities. He descends to take a closer look. Today, there's a steady westerly wind, which he judges to be less than eight knots. He estimates this from the water streaks that run parallel to the wind, the size of the waves, and the absence of whitecaps. The landing is smooth, and he taxis the aircraft to the dock mindful of wind and currents. He makes sure the aircraft is securely tied and is grateful to have some help unloading. Soon, he's on his way again. On this next leg, he'll be refueling and will have the additional concern of passenger handling. Keeping passengers clear of the prop area can be difficult, especially with a twin-engine aircraft when one prop slices an arc directly over the dock. Another hazard is fatigue. Float flying, being seasonal, usually means long days filled with many short trips, especially if business is good. This pilot is careful to stay rested and fit. This was a routine day. The charters were flown efficiently without compromising safety. Whatever your operation, flights can and must be conducted the same way. There are no shortcuts to safety. The accident files tell too many stories of those who were careless and whose shortcuts led them to disaster. This pilot was cruising along at 700 feet, admiring the view when the engine quit. He had neglected to switch to the fullest tank for takeoff, but by the time he realized he had run one tank dry, it was too late to switch tanks, and he crash-landed in trees. A simple check, fuel, mixture, switches, could have prevented the accident. Very often, commercial float flying involves short, low-level hops from settlement to settlement. A pilot who may normally be a careful fuel manager for a long flight can be easily caught off guard by the high fuel consumption on short, low-level operations. If, like this Norseman pilot, your experience on type is limited, you are flying at 350 feet and you run out of fuel, you have problems. The aircraft was completing its eighth flight since refueling when the engine quit. Realizing he was descending too rapidly to reach the open water, the pilot made for a small bay. The aircraft stalled onto the water, broke the float attaching structure, and flipped. Although two of the passengers were seriously injured, all six occupants managed to escape and swim to shore. The most deceptive phenomenon experienced by the float pilot is glassy water. The wind is calm. The water surface looks mirror-like and invitingly easy. Proper depth perception is impossible, 
and if the correct power on landing technique is not used, the pilot tends to either flare too high and stall the aircraft onto the water, or flare too late and fly into it float tips first. Review the glassy water procedures in your AIP and the pilot's operating handbook for your aircraft. Glassy water complicated the situation when this Beaver pilot had an engine failure at 100 feet. He had just taken off from glassy water and because the takeoff run was away from the shoreline had no depth perception for the forced landing. He lowered the nose to prevent the stall but did not level it in time and the left float dug. Overloading, an aft center of gravity, an unrestrained load, and possibly turbulence contributed to the death of the pilot and passenger of this Piper Super Cub. They failed to return from a moose hunting trip and the aircraft was located some six days later vertically embedded in trees. It was likely that due to the 200 pound overload and the rearward C of G, the aircraft had unstable flight characteristics and stalled. Prior to the flight, all seats were removed from this Cessna 185 to load a 100-pound engine. The pilot did not do a pre-takeoff check, and at 1,900 feet, the aircraft lost power. With no lakes to land on, the pilot crashed into a stand of poplar trees. The fuel selector had been bumped to the left tank position during loading and had moved further rearward to the off position during takeoff and climb. When flying floats, it's important to keep current and get a thorough checkout if rusty or transitioning to a new type. This pilot had 7,000 hours of which 3,500 were on floats. However, this was his first float trip in almost two years. He took off from a dolly at a land aerodrome and never got a chance to check the aircraft's attitude on the water. Also, he was unfamiliar with the type of floats fitted to this particular Cessna 185, which were very sensitive to attitude changes. As a result, his touchdown was not flat enough, and the float tips dug into the water. This pilot had no float endorsement. He was flying supplies into the fishing lodge after recently firing his regular pilot. There was a crosswind in the landing area, but his lack of experience prevented him from being able to counteract the drift and as the right wing dug in, the aircraft nosed over. Mountain lakes can be subject to changeable and unpredictable winds. The pilot was showing his passengers a good fishing lake which was located at the end of a box canyon. Looking up the valley to assess the wind, he noticed the south end was glassy, and the north end closest to them was ripply and filled with floating logs. From this, he assumed he would have a headwind for the straight-in approach. Surprise! It was a quartering tailwind which caught the tail after touchdown, spun the aircraft, and caused it to cartwheel. The pilot and two passengers got out, and as they sat on top of the floats, the pilot reassessed the wind conditions. He noticed that by now the entire lake surface was rippled, and realized that what he had seen on final approach was not a static wind condition, but a changing one. The wind had been picking up from the opposite direction and moving down the lake. Boats and float aircraft maintain what is sometimes an uneasy relationship. Boaters do not normally look up for conflicting traffic, and float pilots must be wary of their sometimes unpredictable maneuvers. You have to know the rules of the water as well as the rules of the air. Flat light conditions, a becalmed sailboat with sails lowered, and an aircraft with poor visibility in the landing attitude contributed to this collision. The pilot failed to overfly the landing area to ensure it was clear of traffic and made a long, low, straight-in approach to glassy water. Just seconds before touching down, he noticed the boat directly in front and took evasive action too late to avoid the collision. The front lower keel of the left float struck the boat's transom. The front spreader bar sheared off the mast. When the aircraft hit the water, the damaged float dug in, and the aircraft submerged and rolled over. The pilot and two passengers escaped uninjured, but one of the two occupants of the sailboat was struck and killed while trying to jump clear of the aircraft's path. When docking, it is important to check for poles or pilings that could puncture float hulls or damage wings or horizontal stabilizers. 
Usually, a floating-type dock is ideal, but not always. When wind conditions prevented the pilot from taxiing into the harbor, he tied the aircraft to this floating steel swimming platform. A few hours later, while taxiing for takeoff, the right float began to dig into the water. Very quickly, the aircraft nosed over and sank. It turned out that the corner of the swimming platform had punctured the front compartment of the right float below the water line. The puncture was about two inches by three inches and was shaped to act as a scoop when the aircraft moved forward. Water was forced into the front compartment and also through the two next ones, which were not completely watertight due to the installation of the amphibious landing gear cables which passed through the top of the bulkhead. Keeping a constant vigilance for floating debris is a must, and when rocks and deadheads are submerged, avoiding them is especially difficult. This pilot was taxiing for takeoff when the aircraft struck a submerged rock. He inspected the damage, pumped the float, and attempted to take off. Unable to get airborne, he returned to the dock, offloaded the two passengers, and pumped the float again. On the next takeoff attempt, the aircraft would not climb on the step, and when the pilot throttled back, the nose settled until it submerged and the aircraft overturned. And then there is the problem that constantly plagues pilots of amphibious aircraft. Landing under carriage up when it should be down, and vice versa. The private pilot had 2,500 hours, most of it on floats or amphibians. After takeoff from an airport, he neglected to raise the gear of the amphibious Cessna 185. He forgot to check the position of the gear before landing on the destination lake, and when the wheels contacted the water, the aircraft flipped. Use that checklist. Don't let any of your flights find their way into the accident files. Plan your flight. Know your aircraft. Make sure your machine is properly maintained. Develop your skill at reading the water. Seek advice from the old hands. Train for your level of operation and stay current. Float flying is rewarding and great fun, but it can be demanding. So remember, keep your tips up.